Today we're going to be talking about the book Embattled Rebel, Jefferson Davis as Commander-in-Chief by James McPherson. So this is a really tiny book, but it's so condensed with information that it'll take you a long time to read through it. You know, it took me as long as a regular-sized book. Also, something could be said about the wording in the book. The phraseology is kind of hard to understand, just the way he constructs the sentences. It's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of weird to understand, hard to understand. I once read the biography of Alexander Hamilton by Chernow, and after you read that book, you end up hating Jefferson, you know, his his political rival. You end up thinking, wow, Jefferson was kind of a sniveling little worm. And if you read, like, the biography of John Quincy Adams, you end up disliking Andrew Jackson, his political enemy. Uh, likewise, reading this book, you end up hating uh, P.T. Beauregard and jo- Joseph E. Johnston, who were some generals under Jefferson Davis, um, so that's uh, that's a weird thing that tends to happen, I noticed. The author of this book disclosed in the introduction that he had a bias for the North and against the South. Against the South, which I think, I mean, if you study about the Civil War, you probably live in the South, but I think 99.9% of people in, the, in America would agree that it's a good thing the USA wasn't split and that slavery ended, obviously. Uh, but I really enjoyed that this book lists a number of ways in which the Confederate generals lost the war for Jefferson Davis. And he really details who's to blame. In fact, an alternate title for this video could be like, I don't know, 15 ways the Confederate generals lost the war or um, in defense in defense of Jefferson Davis, something like that, something that clarifies, uh, you know, what went down. So don't be fooled. You know, if you expect uh, to read a book about Jefferson Davis's life, um, this is more of a book about the embattled rebel, you know, who had really incompetent generals, you know, uh, Jefferson Davis during the the, the Civil War, you end up yelling at the pages, the, the, the generals were so incompetent, you know, it's really infuriating. Um, there is some criticism on Goodreads that say that this book is too shallow on the Civil War, right, that it's just adequate, nothing more. Um, but, uh, you know, they say that this book doesn't delve deeply into the Jefferson Davis's early life or, uh, you know, doesn't delve deeply into the Civil War, the Civil War itself. Um, but yeah, okay, that may be true. However, it does have some very interesting insights into the reason some of the decisions were made. Like, he retells the Civil War from the point of view of how the Confederacy screwed things up, how their inner fighting screwed things up, how minor misunderstandings that just happened by chance screwed things up for them. And you, have, you end up uh, realizing the author must have consolidated endless diary accounts and newspaper clippings and the timeline to find out who said what and why and when. He really does have really good nuggets of gold in there. So just don't expect to learn about Jefferson Davis's life in depth. And also don't expect to, this to be a quick read uh, because it's deceivingly small. But it, it, it's, I don't know, it takes a few. Um, he states in the introduction that he came to respect Jefferson Davis a little more, not as much as Lincoln. And he doesn't respect Jefferson Davis's cause, obviously. Who does? But Jefferson Davis looked competent compared to his generals. Uh, before we begin the summary, though, I do want to comment on the final line of the book, because it seemed like a complete contradiction of the whole book. So the last line of the book is basically something like, the Confederacy didn't lose the war, the Union won it. But that was a shock to me, because the whole book was examples of how the Confederate generals lost the war, how they screwed things up. Of course, technically speaking, I can kind of see what he, was, what he meant by that, so I'm, I shouldn't be that pedantic about it. Um, so I can kind of see what what uh, what he's talking about. It just caught me off guard. It caught me off guard. In this video, I give a somewhat detailed summary of the book, and so indirectly, I will give a shallow summary of the Civil War timeline, mentioning memorable factoids that stood out to me. So I repeat, this video will have a summary of Embattled Rebel with excerpts from Embattled Rebel that stood out to me that I found interesting. Um, It'll be rapid fire. I'm going to read as fast as I can. And it'll basically be like after you watch this video, it'll be kind of like you read the book. Um, so that's kind of what I'm going for here. Um, but I still suggest that you read the book because it's a great book. Uh, so let's get started. So the author discusses the idea that Jefferson Davis is to blame for the defeat of the Confederacy. Ulysses S. Grant is, has a quote saying that Jefferson Davis screwed it up. Um, and also, uh, the author mentioned a, an, another historian named David Potter who agreed with that idea. But this author, 
the author of the book we're talking about, uh, James McPherson, claims it was other factors. He lists a number of people who spoke ill of Jefferson Davis, which were many. Robert Toombs being one of them, wanted Jefferson's, Jefferson Davis's spot as president of the Confederacy, and so he spoke ill of Jefferson Davis. The Confederate vice president, uh, even him, Alexander Stevens, spoke ill of Jefferson Davis. P.T. Beauregard also talked crap about him, but was more describing himself, as the um, author put it. He was more describing his own uh, failures. A Georgia congressman who met Jefferson Davis personally thought the criticisms were wrong um, about Jefferson Davis. The author mentions Jefferson Davis got really sick all throughout the war, and I'm not going to be uh, bringing it up, but you can basically you can assume that he was perpetually sick throughout the whole time. Uh, a lot more near um, Chancellorsville. Uh, so anyways, in a way, Jefferson Davis was the last Confederate left standing. Uh, slavery, here's an in interesting uh, point he makes. Slavery was secondary to nationhood, to Jefferson Davis. He wasn't a secessionist at first, but then after he became a secessionist, Jefferson Davis never deviated from becoming a secessionist. Uh, by 1865, though, he would have jettisoned slavery, as we're going to hear more later. Jefferson Davis resigned his seat in the Senate when he heard Mississippi had seceded. He graduated in West Point. He fought in the Mexican-American War. He was made military leader in the Mississippi Army. He had 113 slaves. He was first made provisional president of the Confederacy, and later he was made the you know official president of the Confederacy, but at first he was provisional president. He didn't want the job, though. Uh, none of the other candidates had the military experience he had. Leroy P. Walker, Jefferson Davis's initial Secretary of War, was bad at administration, so Jefferson Davis had to micromanage everything. Uh, J.D., had been Secretary of War in the United States, so he knew better than any other Southerner how to administer an army. And Leroy P. Walker was partly made Secretary of War due to his geography more than anything, more than his skill. So Leroy P. Walker um, only got the job because of his geography, meaning Jefferson Davis set up his cabinet to have one person from each Confederate state so that they would all be represented in his cabinet. They were appointed for political reasons, not so much skill. Uh, his Navy secretary, Stephen R. Mallory, was an excellent choice and created a Navy from basically nothing. Now listen to this. The South had 12% of the industrial capacity of the North. Let me repeat that. The South had 12% of the industrial capacity of the North. According to an 1860 census, Union states had 11 times as many ships and boats and produced 15 times as much iron, 17 times as many textiles, 24 times as many locomotives, and 32 times as many firearms. Un the Union had more than twice the density of mileage per square mile in terms of railroad and several times the amount of rolling stock. Davis was aware of these statistics. He was Secretary of War for a long time. He knew. I mean, think about it. Put yourself in his shoes. You start the war and you realize, just let me repeat that first one. The South had 12% of the industrial capacity of the North. It's doomed from the beginning. Um, so then the author starts talking about Fort Sumter. And uh, so we're talking about Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter was on an artificial island. I found that that was, I, I jotted that down because that was an interesting little factor. I didn't know that. Uh, during Florida's secession, they added a couple outdated forts to the Confederacy. The North put Jefferson Davis's in a catch-22 by resupplying Fort Sumter. If you're uh, familiar with the story of uh, Fort Sumter's, the Confederacy fires at Fort Sumter in South Carolina. And uh, so... Uh, the Union puts him in sort of a catch-22. What, what's he going to do? Because they send a ship to resupply Fort Sumter. So it's like, okay, are you going to attack the ship and dig yourself into a deeper hole uh, in rebellion? Or are you going to let the ship resupply Fort Sumter? The first resolution for an army for the Confederacy had a conscription of six months only. And J.D. pushed for more because obviously the war was going to take more time. Everybody else thought the war would be short. But Lincoln and J.D. knew from the beginning that it was going to be a long war. Uh, at first, Jefferson Davis's uh, speeches, they spoke of no conquest and only a defensive war. But that was disingenuous, as the author writes. Initially, his plans were of an offensive defensive war that would include conquest. Four border slave states had not seceded yet, and he hoped at least three of them would join the Confederacy, and he was prepared to invade them to make it happen. As an example, on April 23rd, he approved shipment for arms to a pro-secession governor to arm his militia to capture a city in Missouri. Uh, 
Jefferson Davis was at the John C. Calhoun School. J.D. wanted to annex Cuba because he thought that would add a pro-slave state. And J.D. opposed California's admission as a free state because he thought slavery could take root there. At J.D.'s plantation, there were nine masters who treated the slaves with relative liberality. The Confederacy did start with an advantage, though. They started with a complete control of the South. You see, usually revolutionaries need to first fight for control of the government, and then fight to keep the control of the of the territory. But in this case, they already started with control of the territory. Um, this military strategy, though, the military strategy of the Confederacy, has been criticized by historians because it seems to violate the principle of concentration of force. They had too much dispersal, which let the enemy break through, capturing and spreading through the territory. In other words, they had too much dispersed defense. To protect slavery, they seem to need to protect every square foot of slave territory. Now get this, the main reason for the dispersal was political. You see, put yourself in Jefferson Davis's shoes, okay? If Jefferson Davis didn't defend a state, that state governor felt neglected, especially when their troops were being taken out of their state to go and defend another state. Many felt Jefferson Davis was moving their armies to defend Virginia only, uh, by the way, which is kind of a parallel of the Revolutionary War, you know, and all the jealousy the states had towards uh, Virginia. Jefferson Davis recognized this point of failure and tried to use interior lines. Sometimes it worked, like in Manassas, sometimes it didn't. Another detriment for the Confederacy was that many times slaves would flock to the Union territory, and that would cause more problems for the Confederates. You see, you have a bunch of slaves that will just flock to the to the you know border there. They moved the capital from Alabama to Virginia so that it would cement Virginia's commitment to the Confederacy. Uh, another point, Judah P. Benjamin replaced Leroy P. Walker as Secretary of, of War. Uh, J.D. preferred an offensive defense, and Lee maybe preferred it even more than Jefferson Davis. Um, so we talked about the start of the Civil War with Fort Sumter. Now we're talking about Manassas, a.k.a. the First Battle of Bull Run. Beauregard, the Confederate general, had 20,000 troops in Manassas Juncture protecting this railroad connection between Richmond to the south and the Shenandoah Valley to the west, where Joseph E. Johnston, another Confederate, commanded 12,000 defending the valley. Each of them were against a larger Union army, but because of the use of interior lines, they could use the railroad to resupply troops where needed faster than the enemy could combine. Beauregard suggested to use this advantage by having Johnston join him for an offensive to recapture Alexandria. Jefferson Davis rejected this plan because the enemy could take over the Shenandoah Valley and then use the same railroad network to attack them from the rear while they were battling their main Union army in the front. So Beauregard came up with an even more ambitious and fanciful plan. Johnston should still join him, then should take Alexandria, then the combined troops should fight the enemy in the valley, whip the enemy there, and then move to defend West Virginia. After this, they could cross to attack Washington. Beauregard's defensive strategy was called by Robert E. Lee, Samuel Cooper, and Jefferson Davis to not have bearing in reality. Jefferson Davis, so his main sort of hope, his main political strategy, strategy for Manassas was that the Union would give him enough time so that they could have enough troops. Uh, but of course that didn't happen. The Union didn't give him enough time to gather enough troops to take an offensive attack uh, that wasn't in southern soil, right? So um, Jefferson Davis told Johnston to leave a small force in the Shenandoah Valley. Now this is a little bit different. You see, what I was explaining before was that P.T. Beauregard's fanciful, unrealistic plan was to have Joseph E. Johnston come with all his force. But Jefferson Davis was like, okay, then what happens if the Union then goes into the Shenandoah Valley and then attacks you from the rear while you're attacking, you know, in Manassas? Well, what happens then? So Jefferson Davis' distinct plan to P.T. Beauregard's was, no, Joseph E. Johnston should leave a small force in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, join Beauregard by rail with the rest of the troops, and he also ordered Theophilus Holmes with 3,000 men in Fredericksburg to go to Manassas too. The use of interior lines and reinforcements won them victory. So you see, they have to pivot. And because they had a good interior line of railroads, they could quickly reinforce each other. That was what made the difference for them in Manassas. Um, the use of interior lines gave them victory. Bull Run was a brutally hot day, but uh, they won Bull Run with interior lines and a good logistic a good logistic supply line from the south through railroad. 
Jefferson Davis visited Bull Run. It was the first of many times that he would visit a battlefield, right? He intimated with some people, you know, intimately, a desire to take command of, in the field. And people like his friend Leonidas Polk expected him to take a command in the field. Joseph E. Johnson suggested he should lead how General Washington did, right? Being the commander-in-chief, but also being down with the troops, leading. Um, so he took a train to Bull Run. It was 10 slow hours you know, um, there was uh, action brewing, and so in anticipation, he took this train. He borrowed a horse then and followed the sound of the guns. There, he found the usual stragglers in the back of the battle with, you know, usually the stragglers have bad news. So he tried to rally the stragglers and uh, tell them, uh, you know, I am Jefferson Davis. Follow me to the front. Some did follow him back. Uh, some didn't. Uh, by the time they got to the front, though, it was already a Union retreat. Jefferson Davis was happy for the win and suggested Beauregard and Johnson order a pursuit. So they, the South wins this battle, and he's like, okay, let's use that momentum to pursue the retreating Union army up north. So he began to take in an order, uh, but upon reflection concluded it, eh, it was too dark. There was too much confusion, you know, with the troops and, and the triumph, um, you know, it, the, the retreat the pursuit wouldn't have been as effective. So the next morning, there was a heavy rain, too, and their supplies were empty. So the pursuit was basically brought to a halt. Uh, in a private letter, also, Joseph E. Johnson said this victory confused the soldiers. All the officers and privates thought they had fulfilled all their obligations to the country. So all these people win, the, win this one battle, and they're like, okay, well, that's it. I'm going home. Uh, war's over, I guess. I'm going home. And it's like, no, we need you to pursue the retreating Union Army. Jefferson Davis promoted Beauregard to full general from previously just Bri brigadier general. Beauregard be became very popular because he was present both in the capture of Fort Sumter and in the victory of Manassas. Beauregard ordered a push forward, but there was no way. It was too slow and it was seen as a sorely missed opportunity. Beauregard, Beauregard blamed the lack of food supplies, which was fa one factor, that's true. It was one of the food supplies. But here's the thing about that detail. Jefferson Davis appointed a guy named Northrop as commissary. Okay, commissary meaning the guy in charge of the food supply. So the author said that Beauregard blamed Northrop for, um, for screwing things up, right? They didn't have enough supply. Well, that's Northrop's fault. But he was indirectly blaming Jefferson Davis for appointing uh, Northrop as commissary. So he was indirectly blaming Jefferson Davis for the failure of, um, you know, uh, capturing the retreat the retreating Union Army, pursuing the re retreating Union Army. Uh, Beauregard acted like he was the main person responsible for the victory of Manassas. So here's the thing. More, an another point. Beauregard had merged his troops with Joseph E. Johnston, who had seniority over basically everybody. But Beauregard, remember, he was brigadier general, not full general. So Beauregard still gave commands to his army. Which that wasn't right because Joseph E. Johnson had seniority as full general, and so Beauregard was a brigadier general. So Judah Benjamin, right? The um, I mentioned he was the uh, Secretary of War, Secretary of War, reprimanded Beauregard, saying, "You are second in command to the whole army, not the first in command to the half the army." You see, Joseph E. Johnson has more seniority. Uh, P. T. Beauregard, like if. If they both combine their armies, P. T. Beauregard can't still be giving commands to his army. Because now he's second in command. So um, he didn't like that, getting reprimanded like that. So Beauregard, um, here's another thing that happened. Very interesting thing. Beauregard didn't submit his report of the battle until very late. In fact, it was so late that Jefferson Davis read the, read the report of Manassas from the newspaper before getting it from Beauregard. But the account in the newspaper mentioned a multi-pronged attack that was rejected by Jefferson Davis. So it implied that Jefferson... Davis had almost prevented the victory of Manassas. So do you remember that fanciful uh, plan that um, P.T. Beauregard had where Joseph E. Johnson should take all his troops out of the Shenandoah Valley, combine his force, and they would move back and forth through all, and Lee and Jefferson Davis and everybody was like, hey, that's not grounded in reality. That plan is dumb. Like it's, that plan is not going to work. So the so Jefferson Davis is sitting there and he reads the account of uh, Manassas from the newspaper. And the newspaper is like, oh, yeah, P.T. Beauregard came up with this brilliant plan and Jefferson Davis rejected it. So it kind of twists, uh, twists uh, what happened. The newspaper somehow got that mixed up and concluded that Jefferson Davis had prevented the Beauregard from pursuing the, the Union Army. 
So not only did the newspaper blame him, say that Jefferson Davis almost prevented the victory of Manassas, but he was like, Jefferson Davis told uh, P.T. Beauregard to not pursue the Union Army. So it's Jefferson Davis's fault that there was no pursuit of the Union Army. Uh, Jefferson Davis thought Beauregard was trying to extol himself, and Jefferson Davis never really trusted him again. P.T. Beauregard also didn't like his low rank, but the thing is most people still thought the victory was due to Beauregard and the blame was Jefferson Davis's. Jefferson Davis didn't set the record straight because he th said explaining himself would reveal their army's weaknesses to the enemy. And this is a reoccurring fact. Time and time again he gets blamed and time and time again he refuses to explain publicly what the, the fundamental problem of the army, so Confederate army, which is they just don't have enough resources. They don't have enough food. They don't have enough manufacturing. Nothing. And time and time again, Jefferson Davis doesn't want to reveal this fact publicly and defend his, his uh, reputation. Um, a lot of people still believed it, though, and they still believed the narrative that Jefferson Davis stopped the pursuit because he wanted a defensive defense. Remember how Jefferson Davis was talking about, you know, no conquest and all that in the beginning? Well, secretly, like the author pointed out, secretly, he did want an offensive defense. He wanted it more than anybody, except maybe Lee. Um... But uh, the narrative was stuck. There was no Confederate offensive that fall because the states were already complaining to Jefferson Davis about moving soldiers from their states to defend Virginia, right? Dispersed defense, right? The governors were writing Jefferson Davis's, um, you know, writing him hard about why they keep moving soldiers out of their states to protect Virginia. And there was no offensive uh, from the North because McClellan miscalculated the number of Confederate troops to be much larger than what was in reality. So now we're going to talk about Kentucky, the Kentucky theater. So Kentucky declared itself neutral at first, and Lincoln and Jefferson Davis didn't move troops into Kentucky because doing so first would move Kentucky to side with their enemy. So Confederate and Unionists were smuggling weapons into Kentucky and creating home guards. Major General Leonidas Polk was Jefferson Davis's old friend after West Point. Uh, he was an Episcopalian priest and then bishop, and then he became a general, right? So uh, Jefferson Davis's friend, Leonidas Polk, feared Grant would seize the heights overlooking the Mississippi River. So Polk moved into Columbus, uh, Kentucky. Polk's fears were well-founded and his movements were militarily sound, but it was a political blunder. Kentucky immediately denounced the Confederate invaders, asking Grant to defend them. Jefferson Davis ordered his Secretary of War to order, to order Polk to withdraw. But this telegraph crossed with Polk's telegraph, explaining Polk's actions. And, be, and so Jefferson Davis read Polk's action and he became indecisive. Jefferson Davis replied that Polk should provide a fuller explanation before getting approval. But Polk misinterpreted the wording of the telegraph as the approval itself. Grant's actions was a response to Polk's and came at the request of the Kentucky legislature. Jefferson Davis agreed with Polk, ultimately, that military needs were more important than political needs. So even though it was a political blunder, eh, maybe Polk was right to do that. So Jefferson Davis, uh, finally, though, Jefferson Davis sent Albert Sidney Johnston to take over the Kentucky, the Kentucky stuff. Albert Sidney Johnston was Jefferson Davis's idol and mentor. He was also from Kentucky. He turned down a high command in the Union Army and got second-ranking full general in the Confederacy Army. Johnston was a close friend to Jeff Jefferson Davis. And as a close friend, you know, he was in Kentucky and he pleaded with Jefferson Davis for reinforcements. He had only 40,000 men to defend a line 500,000 miles long from the Cumberland Gap to southwest Missouri. Jefferson Davis couldn't spare any accoutrements to Kentucky. So Albert Sidney Johnston had a lot of ingenuity, though. He leaked bloated numbers to scare the enemy. It scared Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, who became distressed, and the press said he went insane. He was replaced by Don Carlos Buell. Johnston gradually received reinforcements and eventually a substantial reinforcement from Virginia with P.T. Beauregard. P.T. Beauregard was unhappy as second-in-command with Joseph E. Johnston, but was okay being in the same position under Albert Sidney Johnston. Jefferson Davis was happy to see Beauregard leave Virginia, too. Grant was planning an attack on the Confederacy in its most vulnerable points, Fort Henry 
and Fort Donaldson on the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers, respectively, just south of the Tennessee and Kentucky borders. The Confederacy had virtually no navy on these waters. Ironclads captured Fort Henry on the Tennessee River. Two timberclads did a lot of damage down Alabama. Uh, they burned a railroad bridge that connected two of Johnston's main forces at Columbus and Boy uh, Bowling Green. Grant prepared to march against Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland River. Here's, here's the kicker, though. The fall of Fort Henry shocked Jefferson Davis so much that he sent men from Pensacola and New Orleans to Tennessee, a plan he previously had rejected. He had rejected that idea because it was a bad idea, but the, fort of, uh, but the fall of Fort Henry shocked him so much that he went against his better judgment. So orders went to Braxton Bragg in Pensacola and Mansfield Level in New Orleans to send 7,000 or 8,000 men to Tennessee and Kentucky. A few days later, though, J.D. ordered Bragg to leave Pensacola altogether and go personally with the rest of his troops to Tennessee. Of course, Pensacola, after, after Bragg left, the Union occupied Pensacola. Jefferson Davis also ordered the river defense fleet of the Confederate gunboats at New Orleans to go up the Mississippi. These actions let the Federals take control of New Orleans and gain control of Lower Mississippi River two months later. So that was a huge mistake. Exactly. What ended up happening was exactly what Jefferson Davis had warned against when he initially rejected the moves. None of the reinforcements could save Johnston's Fort Donaldson in time. So it was all for basically nothing. P.T. Beauregard once again came up with a fanciful plan to smash Grant. Again, it wasn't rooted in reality, and Johnson rejected it. Johnston wanted to give up Kentucky and retreat to Nashville-Memphis line, leaving a token force in Fort Donaldson to delay Grant, and concentrating the rest of the army to fight in more favorable conditions. But for some unexplained reason, Johnston decided to make a real stand in Fort Donaldson. Instead of sending all troops to Fort Donaldson, however, he took 12,000 to Donaldson, increasing the total to 17,000, and retreated the rest to Nashville. Both J.D. and Lincoln oftentimes found it necessary to appoint influential political leaders to military office. Up to uh, around 30% of the generals were just generals with political weight. They weren't appointed generals because of their military skills. John B. Floyd and Gideon Pillow were among that 30%. They were just political military appointments, and they just happened to have go to go uh, and they just happened to be in charge of taking care of Fort Donaldson against two of the best Union generals. Floyd and Pillow, what they ended up doing was deserting. They just left the scene. They abandoned it and left Simon Boulevard Buckner to surrender 13,000 troops to Grant a week before the fall of Nashville. J.D. and Albert Sidney Johnson were blamed for the loss. J.D. relieved Floyd and Pillow unceremoniously. In February, a Union task force captured Roanoke Island. More than 2,500 troops surrendered there. This also stopped the blockade runners. North Carolinians asked for more men to defend their coast, but J.D. had none to send. North Carolina and Virginia newspapers criticized Davis. Judah P. Benjamin, the Secretary of War, got a blunt of the blame for the losses. They did an inquiry on him, and J.D. wanted it to be done in private so that the Union didn't know the lack of resources they had. Benjamin resigned. He was replaced by a grandson of Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin was made Secretary of State. Uh, J.D., at that point, was inaugurated as the president of the Confederacy from going to interim president to full president in a six-year term. J.D. changed from a dispersed defense to one of concentration, and he acknowledged his error of trying to defend every inch of slave territory in order to defend the South. Albert Sidney Johnston was under threat that Buell and Grant would combine forces, attack him, and capture Corinth. Polk received orders to abandon his huge Columbus, Kentucky fortifications and defend Corinth. In Arkansas, Earl Van Dorn received orders to cross the Mississippi to join Johnston, abandoning Missouri and northern Arkansas to the enemy. Davis and Johnston intended to risk it all to hit Grant in the Tennessee River at Pittsburgh's Landing before he could join forces with Buell. Uh, the author points out this was the first example of offensive defense. It was near a small church named Shiloh Church. Johnston, during the battle, got hit and bled to death. Beauregard took over. And let me emphasize this line. Beauregard called a halt after he took over. 
Grant's line, after Beauregard called a halt, Grant's line began to stiffen, and he started getting reinforcements from Buell. They were starting to combine. Beauregard sent a telegraph to J.D. exclaiming a victory, and the last line mentioned Johnston's death, and that made him sad. But unknown to Davis, it was the Confederacy that was retreating at that moment to Corinth after a counterattack from now a more reinforced Grant. Johnston's death had been in vain. Jefferson Davis wept for the death of his friend. And some modern historians think it was a mistake for Beauregard to call the halt that night. But for the record, not all modern historians think that was a mistake. Because of the retreat, Jefferson Davis uncharacteristically pushed the panic button. J.D. called troops from different states, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, to send all the men they could spare to Beauregard. Earl Van Dorn, remember Earl Van Dorn from Arkansas, who was told to just basically leave Arkansas for the enemy, cross the Mississippi, and come help? So Earl Van Dorn finally arrived. He didn't get there in time, though, for the Battle of Shiloh. Beauregard faced Buell, Grant, and Major General John Pope under Major General Henry W. Halleck. Halleck advanced at a snail pace, though, threatening to start a siege. Outnumbered two to one, Beauregard pulled out. Beauregard retreated. Before he could be surrounded, he retreated to Tupelo. So what happened? Well, Memphis surrendered. And P.T. Beauregard wired to Jefferson Davis that his retreat was brilliant and successful. And J.D. was shocked and disgusted by it. So what did J.D. do? Well, J.D. sent the son of Albert Sidney Johnston, the guy who had died, to ask Beauregard a series of questions. Why didn't he reinforce? How many men did he lose? Why didn't he attack their communications? What were his plans? This was to express his unhappiness with P.T. Beauregard's decision to retreat. Beauregard then decided to take a leave of absence to basically disappear, to go to a spa. He got a surgeon's note because he had been feeling ill. He got a surgeon's note and went to a spa. And this obviously, well, it made me furious reading it, but it made Jefferson Davis furious. Not only did um, P.T. Beauregard retreat and lose Memphis and get, you know, waste the death of Albert Sidney Johnson, but he did it and then went to a spa. So this was the last straw. J.D. replaced uh, P.T. Beauregard with Braxton Bragg. But you have to remember that Beauregard was uh, very popular because of the fall of uh, Fort Fort Sumter and um, the Manassas. So he still gave him a position. Uh, He gave Beauregard the defense of Charleston, which, for the record, P.T. Beauregard did an okay job defending Charleston. Another perfect storm problem came to the Confederacy. Remember how I mentioned that conscriptions were only six months and that wasn't going to be enough? Well, a bunch of the one-year enlistments ended up being due to expire around the same time. So you have a bunch of troops, a bunch of soldiers that are just leaving because their time is due. Well, Congress found saw this problem and they offered a remedy. But what ended up happening was the remedy they offered was more disruptive to the regiments than if they just had let them expire. Plus, you have to realize... A lot of the states had different conflicting provisions and exceptions for their troops. So in the end, Congress decided that the best uh, solution to the problem would have been a draft. And that was very unpopular with a lot of people, including the governor of Georgia, Joseph Brown. He said a draft was a violation of the state rights. And it was a contradiction of the whole purpose why they seceded from the Union to begin with. That's not going to be the last we're going to hear from uh, Joseph Brown, the Georgia um, governor. But it was really just the perfect storm. The author also discusses how they became more tyrannical. Jefferson Davis and Lincoln became more tyrannical as the war progressed. Lincoln, for example, suspended the the writ of habeas corpus and would put his opponents in jail. In the uh, opinion of the author, Lincoln didn't rein in his power, while Jefferson Davis at least restricted himself to the laws passed by Congress. However, Jefferson Davis was far from innocent. Uh, According to historian Mark Neely, he found 4,000 political prisoners in the Confederacy. Ultimately, both Davis and Lincoln were obsessed with winning the war and eventually ignored their own constitution if it meant victory was at stake. In a military strategy conference, they discovered that Johnston was vulnerable to a flanking maneuver by McClellan. He had been vulnerable the whole time. So they wanted Johnston to move south where it was a better defensive position. But the bad winter road conditions made a withdrawal more difficult for Johnston. So they told him to send his big guns and food south as the road conditions improved. Well, in early March, Johnston's scouts saw some movement and confused it with McClellan's flanking position movement. 
And so they got spooked and they retreated very quickly because they were still, they hadn't moved all the way, so they were still vulnerable to McClellan's thing. So Johnston retreated so quickly that he ended up destroying guns and ammunitions. Now in Richmond, Jefferson Davis heard rumors about this retreat, but couldn't believe it. When he finally heard it from Johnston himself, he was shocked. This was another loss of ammunition that the Confederacy couldn't afford. The author mentions how Davis and Lee knew each other from West Point. Lee had a mixed record at first, but Davis trusted his skill. J.D. made a bill to make Lee commander of the army, but Congress added an amendment to the bill to try to make it so that J.D. couldn't contradict, couldn't override Lee. But J.D. vetoed that amendment because, it, because he saw it as an usurpation of the commander-in-chief position. The Union was putting too much pressure on Richmond, so Lee instructed Stonewall Jackson to make distractionary attacks on the Shenandoah Valley, and that was a really successful campaign, and it relieved some of the pressure in Virginia. McClellan's army started landing in Fort Monroe, at the tip of the peninsula in Virginia. So now we're talking about McClellan's amphibious assault on Richmond. When they started advancing to Richmond towards the Confederate General John B. Magruder, Lee and J.D. ordered Joseph E. Johnson to send troops to help Magruder. But then they instructed him to send his whole army, so go help Magruder in full. Johnston inspected Magruder's lines in Yorktown. He told them to withdraw from Yorktown to Richmond, concentrate all Virginia troops there, send troops from Georgia and the Carolinas there, and then win the decisive battle, and then go back and reclaim the lost territory. So again, to reiterate that, Johnston comes to help Magruder, inspects the lines, and then his suggestion is, hey, let's get out of here, let's retreat, regroup, and then attack again, reclaiming the land we gave up. They argued for a long time, Lee saying that in Yorktown, Big Guns and Gloucester, Nar- uh, not Gloucester Narrows and the CSS Virginia would protect their flank. Randolph, who was there, said they'd lose the Navy Yard at Norfolk if they retreated from there. And J.D. sided with Lee and with Randolph and did not side with Joseph E. Johnson. McClellan who was kind of incompetent and o- always overestimated Confederate, uh, Confederate numbers, set a siege, even though he could have attacked because he had 110,000 troops versus 60,000. He could have easily attacked, but he decided to set a siege. So again, to reiterate, Johnston gave his suggestion and they told him no in that military strategy meeting. They said, no, that's not going to work. Well, Johnston, even though they told him no, still wanted to pull out of Yorktown without a fight. But he instead just didn't tell Jefferson Davis until the very end. And when he did tell Jefferson Davis and Lee about his intentions, they told him, no, don't do that. And he told him, well, I'm going to still do it, but I'm going to give it one more day. Well, that day transpired, and then he pulled out. They retreated and fought a rear guard battle, retreating to 20 miles from Richmond behind the Chickaham... Chickahominy River, and Norfolk fell to the Union. The CSS Virginia had to be blown up because it was too big to go upriver. Davis was depressed because of this. The author mentions how Jefferson Davis turned to religion in these dark times. Well, the batteries at Drury's Bluff drove back the Union's USS Monitor and other Union ships and saved Richmond, Virginia, from the fate of New Orleans. You know, it saved it from uh, getting captured the same way that New Orleans was captured. Jefferson Davis expected Johnson to defend. He still trusted Johnson would do the right thing. However, Johnston had already decided in his mind that he would retreat again to just three or four miles east of Richmond. Jefferson Davis was going to visit Johnston, and he was galloping to the battle, but he was surprised to discover that Johnston was actually closer than he expected him to be. Why? Because he had retreated. Johnson said the land was too swampy. J.D. asked, do you expect to give up Richmond without a battle? Jefferson Davis summoned Lee and asked Johnson to attend. They wanted Johnson to explain his plan, but Johnson didn't show up to the meeting. They came up with a plan, Lee and uh, Jefferson Davis, and Jefferson Davis wrote to see it commence himself. You know, they told Johnson this plan, and they, so Jefferson Davis wrote to see it commence himself. But when the time came for it to start, nothing happened. And no one told him why it was called off. Well, General Gustavo Smith was leading the division in charge of starting the attack. And uh, Gustavo Smith told him that a local citizen told him the enemy was strongly stationed. So he chickened out, basically. And by the way, it wasn't the first time that Gustavo Smith had chickened out. Well, once again, they planned another attack one week later. And the exact same scenario happened again. Johnson planned to attack the right flank of McClellan. And again, he called it off. Johnston explained that he didn't want to alert Jefferson Davis of this because 
it was like putting too much pressure on Jefferson Davis, and he didn't want to stress him out. The Battle of Seven Pines happened. In the Battle of Seven Pines, J.D. heard gunfire from his place, so he rode to the battlefield. And when he got there, he saw Johnston riding to the front. Johnston's men were convinced that Johnston rode to the front in order just to avoid Jefferson Davis. The Battle of Seven Pines didn't go well for the Confederacy, though. J.D. came under musket fire during it. Johnston was seriously wounded during it, and he was carried on a stretcher. J.D. felt really bad about it. J.D. set Robert E. Lee as the commander for the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee ordered the soldiers to dig earthworks, and so much so that he ended up with the nickname the King of Spades, although the, the brunt of the work was done by slaves. Davis kept going to watch battles and getting reprimanded for endangering his life. J.D. was present at each of the battles and helped wrangle the stragglers in the back. John Pope got beat at the Battle of Cedar Mounts by Lee, and the Battle of Second Manassas opened Maryland to the invasion that J.D. wanted for a while, the defensive offense, Antietam. Lee pointed out they didn't have the resources to invade the North, but he agreed the need, they needed to start their offensive defense. He just said there was a lot of risk to it. J.D. departed from Richmond to Maryland to see the battle. They got as far as Warrington, Virginia. Uh, J.D.'s health started giving him problems after that, so he wanted to go see the battle, but he turned around. The plans for Antietam were found wrapped around three cigarettes. A careless courier must have done that. McClellan didn't move quickly enough to save Harper's Ferry, but they won Antietam, even though it was the single deadliest day. Braxton Bragg captured Mumfordville. Three weeks after Antietam, Bragg's Army of Tennessee tied with Buell's Army of the Ohio at Kentucky. Kirby Smith retreated. Van Dorn and Price couldn't recapture Corinth against Grant. After a bunch of losses, including Antietam, J.D. was pretty down. Three Union armies launched new offensives. Grant in Vicksburg, Rosecrans... Army of the Cumberland against Nashville, and Burnside at Hills in Fredericksburg. J.D. wanted South Carolina people to come to Virginia. Florida and Alabama had disaster after disaster, but noted that the Union outnumbered them and could easily move numbers by water, so they just had to fight outnumbered. Their only, only alternative was to abandon important points. Notwithstanding all of this, Florida and Alabama remained loyal to the Confederacy, though Arkansas and Louisiana had trouble with loyalty because they were cut off. Arkansas threatened secession. The governor of Arkansas threatened to secede if left undefended. Most Arkansas troops were ordered to go east. Union forces occupied northern Arkansas because of this. Jefferson Davis didn't return the Arkansas troops to Arkansas, but instead sent a guy named Hindman, who went and declared a conscription and declared martial law. Due to complaints, Theophilus Holmes was sent to replace Hindman. Holmes was mediocre and almost half deaf. There was a shuffle to cover two places. Pemberton was promoted. So this is the timeline. Pemberton was promoted. Pemberton was disliked because he was from Pennsylvania. He joined because his wife was from Virginia. Beauregard seceded Pemberton. Pemberton faced a two-pronged attack, Grant overland from West Tennessee and Sherman going down the Mississippi River. Pemberton needed all the help he could get. Jefferson Davis asked Holmes, from Arkansas, remember, to send help, but didn't word it as a command, but rather a plead. J.D. tried to persuade Holmes by telling him that Arkansas's best defense was to keep the line connected to the rest of the Confederacy. Holmes resisted. He, didn't, he just didn't have the number of troops Jefferson Davis thought he had. Most were sick and couldn't get there in time and would desert if sent east of the Mississippi. The matter, though, became moot because Van Dorn raided the Union supply lines in Mississippi, forcing Grant to turn back, and Pemberton's troops repulsed Sherman's at Chickasaw Bluff. Again, Jefferson Davis was a micromanager. J.D. buried himself in paperwork. Sometimes he would sign 200 papers a day. Jefferson Davis preferred running the army instead of the navy and gave the navy guy basically full autonomy. Mallory, the navy guy, was never, never replaced. On the other hand, the Secretary of War was occupied by five people. Jefferson Davis micromanaged so much that he reduced the Secretary of War, George Randolph, to basically a clerk. He would just get, like, papers, and the first message was, hey, just sign these. Uh, without consulting Jefferson Davis, Randolph authorized Holmes to cross the Mississippi and join Pemberton to fight Grant. This was different from Jefferson Davis's plan to send part of his force, but to remain personally in Arkansas with the rest. Uh, he was rebuked by Jefferson Davis, and Randolph immediately resigned because he was so unhappy with his uh, position that he was waiting for an excuse to resign. Joseph E. Johnson healed and wanted to get back in command, but Robert E. Lee had already made the army his own.
Johnston started having problems with Bragg, and Bragg had problems with his subordinates. His subordinates blamed Bragg for the failure of Kentucky, the Kentucky campaign. Jefferson Davis asked Bragg's subordinates, Polk and Kirby Smith, to give their full support to Bragg, and he kind of quote-unquote bribed them in advance with promotions to lieutenant generals. Jefferson Davis put Johnson in charge of all the territory between the Appalachian Mountains and Mississippi River. Johnson had to coordinate actions between three armies, Bragg's in Tennessee, Kirby, Kirby Smith, east of Tennessee, and Pemberton in Mississippi. Johnson thought it should include Holmes' army on the other side of the Mississippi, but Jefferson Davis decided, maybe unwisely, against it. In paper, Johnson appeared to be the most important assignment, but he began complaining about the lack of authority almost immediately. J.D. visited Johnson's theater, but first he made a stop at Bragg's headquarters in Tennessee and found it in better condition than he expected, and he thought Pemberton was in more danger than Bragg. He wanted to send people from Bragg to help Pemberton, Johnson protested it would fatally weaken Bragg, and Pemberton should be reinforced instead by Holmes in Arkansas. But like we already said, J.D. had already tried that plan. So J.D. ordered the divisions. It arrived in time to help repel Sherman at Chickasaw Bluff, but Bragg would sorely miss it in Murfreesboro. It may have been the difference between victory and defeat, according to his, uh, contemporary historians. Both J.D. and Johnson went to inspect Vicksburg's defenses. In his way there, J.D. gave a bunch of speeches and to unify Southern people would read a list of Union atrocities saying they were committing unseen horrible things like arson and rape. At first, J.D. complained about the Union's constitutional violations. In parentheses, though, J.D. also violated the Constitution. Well, the Emancipation Proclamation happened and uh, it was declared and J.D. took it as a vindication of secession. They captured, at one point, they captured six black Union soldiers and J.D. said it co they couldn't be treated as soldiers, so he ordered them to be executed. Uh, in parentheses, the author clarifies that it's unknown if they were actually executed. So now we're talking about Braxton Bragg's uh, The Battle of Murfreesboro. So they had a lot of missed opportunities and had to retreat even though initially the Confederacy was winning. Braxton Bragg declared victory, in fact, but the Union was not falling back in reality. Braxton Bragg ordered another attack, even though he was warned not to by his subordinates, and his attack was shredded by Union artillery. Bragg withdrew south. Jefferson Davis ordered Johnson to visit the army for advice and to inspect the troops. One of uh, Bragg's subordinates that hated him, Polk, wanted Johnson to replace Bragg. Jefferson Davis thought Johnson would like to take over Bragg because Johnson kept, kept complaining. Jo Johnson said Bragg was doing great and there was no problems with infighting or anything like that. Johnson thought it would be dishonorable that after giving Bragg a bad grade in his report, he would then go and replace Bragg. So he was afraid of backlash of a conflict of interest. But Jefferson Davis found out soon after that the report Johnson gave wasn't, wasn't accurate. The problems with infighting remained uh, his subordinates still fought with with uh, Bragg. Jefferson Davis ordered his Secretary of War to order Johnson to take over Bragg's army and send Bragg to Richmond for reassignment. But Johnson made the excuse that Bragg's wife had fallen fallen in ill, so he couldn't replace uh, Bragg. And then later, that he himself had fallen ill, so Bragg should stay. So he kept making excuses, and he kept Bragg in co in his command. At this point in the timeline, Hooker from the Union did his fourth attempt at attacking Richmond, leaving part of his army at Fredericksburg and the other part to come at Lee's rear. Lee divided his army and sent uh, Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, to attack Hooker's flank, which he did, driving Hooker back to Chancellorsville. Stonewall Jackson died of pneumonia after getting shot by his own men at Chancellorsville. Ulysses S. Grant was approaching Vicksburg. J.D. hoped cavalry raids on Grant's supply line would cut him off like they had done last time. But this time, Grant was living off the land and was already off of his supply line, so they wouldn't work at all. The situation in Virginia seemed stable, but Lee was still outnumbered. He suggested to reincorporate Longstreet's division and take it up to Pennsylvania. It was basically a question of Vicksburg, Mississippi, or Virginia. Which one do you want to save? Jefferson Davis didn't think Vicksburg was less important than Virginia, for the record. He was resolute, resolute they should hold the Mississippi. J.D. sent Johnson to defend Jackson, Mississippi. But Johnson saw it was too late when he arrived. Grant was about to capture Jackson and then go to Vicksburg. Johnston ordered Pemberton to evacuate Vicksburg to join Johnston and then reclaim the lost territory. Sound familiar? Well, Pemberton was reluctant to do it because he had been ordered by J.D. 
He was afraid of being accused of treason. Okay, remember how Pemberton, people didn't like him because he was already a northerner. People didn't trust him. Anyways, Grant had many victories in Champions Hill and Big Black River Bridge that made the question moot. Pemberton ended up having to fall back to Vicksburg, and Grant started a siege. Johnston's reinforcements to Vicksburg arrived in dribbles. Johnston refused to attack with his 23,000 against 30,000 under Sherman that Grant had put in his rear to protect his 40,000 besieging Pemberton's 30,000. So remember, Grant is setting a siege to Vicksburg. Grant has 40,000. Pemberton only has 30,000. Grant, in his rear, put Sherman with 30,000. And Johnston is trying to attack those 30,000 with his 23,000. But here's the thing. Johnston says he has 23,000. Jefferson Davis thought Johnston had 31,000. The author of the book thinks it was fewer than 31,000, but it was more than what Johnston was admitting to. The people of Vicksburg were hopeful Johnston would save them, but Vicksburg fell to Union's forces. Jefferson Davis was furious with Johnson. He thought Vicksburg shouldn't have been lost without a fight. Jefferson Davis blamed Johnson for the loss of Vicksburg. J.D. ordered Johnson to hold the capital if possible, but Johnson was afraid of being encircled by Grant. So he left so hastily he felt to secure some 400 rail and locomotives which the Confederacy would sorely miss. Fort Hudson, the other important port to hold the Mississippi, then surrendered. Soon after, the Confederacy was cut in two. Davis was depressed. Davis didn't like people blaming Pemberton for the loss of Vicksburg, but Davis harshly blamed Johnston for not attacking. Davis relieved Johnston of his command, making Bragg independent of Johnston. On their way to Gettysburg, the Confederacy captured a lot of slaves that they claim had been runaway slaves, even though a lot of them had actually been born in Pennsylvania. Well, a third of Lee's army died, were captured, or injured in the Battle of Gettysburg. Jefferson Davis' vice president, Alexander Stevens, offered to Jefferson Davis to mediate a peace treaty between the South and his personal friend, Abraham Lincoln. But Alexander Stevens didn't know about J.D.'s plans for Gettysburg. But J.D. sold it to him like this. He pitched it like this. He said, when we're on northern soil, well, that's the best bargaining tool for having a peace treaty with, with Lincoln. And the cabinet agreed, so Alexander Stevens went along with it. Well, the loss of Gettysburg and Vicksburg happened near the same time. And when Lincoln uh, heard about the defeat at Gettysburg, he said that Alexander Stevens' request for a meeting was inadmissible. The defeat was so detrimental that Lee offered to resign to Jefferson Davis after uh, Gettysburg. Unaware of the fall of Vicksburg, Theopolis Holmes ordered an attack from Arkansas as a diversion to aid Vicksburg, and those troops got squashed. That opened Arkansas for a Union offensive, and they captured Little Rock. Jefferson Davis replaced Holmes after defending Holmes' reputation for a long time, trusting him, maybe even more than Holmes trusted himself. Jefferson Davis replaced him with Kirby Smith. Kirby Smith was given autonomy by Jefferson Davis, and after Grant basically cut off Arkansas from the rest of the of the Confederacy because of the fall of the Mississippi, um, then Kirby Smith basically had full autonomy. Still, the biggest headache for Jefferson Davis was Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee. Rosecrans from the Union and the Confederacy didn't really do much fighting, except trying to mess with each other's communication lines. After much prodding by Lincoln, Rosecrans finally attacked. Almost in a week, the Confederates lost control of Middle Tennessee. It was the same week as Vicksburg and Gettysburg. The infighting between Leonidas Polk and William Hardy versus Bragg came back. We're talking about Chattanooga now. The Union split the Confederacy in two. As a summary, the Union split the Confederacy in two and can split it in three if they went through Chattanooga. Rosecrans began a new advance to try to do just that. Jefferson Davis instructed Johnston to send 9,000 troops from Mississippi to Bragg. He asked Robert E. Lee if Lee was able to take over the Army of Tennessee, but Lee didn't want to. He demurred. Lee suggested a fight against Virginia would remove pressure from Tennessee. Rosecrans from the Union moved into Chattanooga, and Bragg left it. Bragg had a strategy, though, uh, an uh, ingenious strategy, to send deserters to Union lines and talk about how demoralized the Confederates are, are, essentially baiting the Union to attack them. Bragg tried to get them to attack in little pieces by making up a story that 
the demoralized Confederate troops were going to retreat in three little sections through three little mountain gaps. So Rosecrans sectioned out his armies and sent them to cut off these imaginary ret retreats. Well, in three different occasions, Bragg commanded to attack Rosecrans in detail. And the three times, his corps and division commanders found excuses to disobey his orders and to not attack. After Rosecrans found out about his mistake, he mended his mistake, and Bragg's plan was lost. Bragg's opportunity to defeat the enemy in detail was gone. Longstreet arrived with his army and gave the Confederacy a rare number superiority in Chattanooga. Bragg told Longstreet to attack forward and Polk to attack from the right. As time passed, though, there was no attack. This was to cut off the Union from their base, while well, Polk and Longstreet just seemed to act with little urgency. It was only Bragg's personal supervision that got the attacks started. Because of a mix-up in orders in the Union side, Longstreet encountered a gap in the Union lines and broke through, sending a third fleeing to the rear. Only a determined stand by George Thomas prevented a full Union collapse. Bragg defeated the Union, though, but the Union still held Chattanooga, so Bragg set for a siege. The Union doubled down instead of giving in. Grant sent reinforcements to help Rosecrans and also went himself to Ch Chattanooga. He replaced Rosecrans with George Thomas, sent Sherman with four more divisions. The Federals were setting a counterattack to reverse Chickamauga. Polk told Jefferson Davis that Bragg had to go. A bunch of generals signed a petition for Bragg's removal. The replacement of Bragg would have been Johnston or Beauregard, which Jefferson Davis didn't want. So Jefferson Davis kept Bragg. Davis went on a tour to Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and South Carolina. He consulted with political leaders and gave speeches. Jefferson Davis' decision to keep Bragg was very unpopular, it turned out. Northern troops with Hooker, with reinforcements from the Army of the Potomac, got the Confederates out of Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain. George Thomas, in the Army of the Cumberland, broke through Confederate lines in Missionary Ridge with an attack that shouldn't have succeeded, but did. The breakthrough happened mostly at Major General John C. Beckenridge's corps. His dispositions were faulty, and he appeared to have been drunk. But the blame still fell on Bragg. Bragg resigned, and Jefferson Davis accepted promptly. People blamed Jefferson Davis, too, for retraining, retaining Bragg for too long. Hardy turned down the job of taking over Bragg's army. Lee was offered, but kind of declined and suggested Beauregard. And after that, he suggested Johnston. Jefferson Davis cared more for military strategy than other things. Jefferson Davis made a great choice appointing Josias Gorgas, Chief of Ordnance, Commissary General, and Quartermaster General. Josias Gorgas was a master in organization and improvisation. He built an arms industry virtually from scratch and created a number of blockade runners to circumvent the blockade. Church bells were melted and turned into cannons. Moonshiners took their appeal of patriotism and turned their copper metal for rifle parts. Women saved chamber pot stuff for creating gunpowder. Gorgas boasted he was humble, but he boasted of his own achievements privately in his diary. He mentioned the Tredegar works, which I uh, visited, and uh, Gorgas was from Pennsylvania, but didn't have the prejudice others like Pemberton faced. But even his in ingenuity couldn't handle the deterioration of the southern railroads. Lucius Northrop was the commissary. His personality made things worse, though. Everyone complained about their little rations. Northrop didn't help the situation by having a centralized system of procurements and distribution of food. Purchasing food closer to where it was needed would have been more expensive, but also more effective, probably. Some of the problems were beyond his control, though. Thousands of acres were lost. The fall of Vicksburg and Port Hudson lost them food also, and the inflation made farmers not want to sell to the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis kept Northrop in place because he knew it wasn't Northrop's fault, but it appeared to outsiders like he just kept incompetent people in place. Ironically, J.D. undercut Northrop's biggest attempt at feeding the troops by cutting the trade of southern cotton for northern food and salt. Northrop told Jefferson Davis the army couldn't be sustained without trading with the Union. Kirby Smith from Arkansas, the guy who had basically full autonomy in Arkansas, found he couldn't feed people without trading with the Union. And in that case, Jefferson Davis looked the other way. Women throughout the South rioted and went to food shops to steal food armed with revolvers. In Richmond, there was a riot full of women who went to the governor's office and demanded he give them their emergency food provisions. A militia came. The mayor told him he'd fire. Davis arrived at that moment and appealed to their patriotism. He told them he'd give them five minutes to disperse and held up his watch. He told the militia to load their guns, and at four minutes they dispersed. 
and it is unknown to this day if he was really going to make the order to shoot or if the militia would have really fired if ordered to. You see, the crowd would have included some of their wives. Well, in the end, 44 women and 29 men were arrested for being part of the mob. The guy in charge of clothing the troops was named Meyer. He had a similar problem to Northrop, but it was kind of the opposite. He was popular with Congress, and he was unpopular with Jefferson Davis. Well, Jefferson Davis issued a proclamation that captured Union officers and black men would be turned over to the states for inciting slave insurrections. Congress endorsed it, but substituted state courts for military courts. Uh, the, Jefferson da- the Jefferson Davis administration agreed to restore ex-slave officers instead of killing them, though a bunch were killed by angry Southerners. Abraham Lincoln issued an order of retaliation. For every Union captive executed, a Confederate would be treated likewise. And for every captive enslaved, a Confederate would be put in hard labor on public works. It stopped the official killings of ex-slave soldiers, but not the re-enslavement. The South refused to exchange black soldiers, and this caused the prisoner exchange program to stop, and the POW camp started overcrowding. After the loss of Gettysburg, some wanted to negotiate a peace. A guy from North Carolina named Holden wanted to negotiate an end independently. Jefferson Davis called it treasonous. Well, the defeats lowered morale and a lot of people wanted to negotiate peace. And like I said, it was especially in North Carolina. The governor was under pressure from pro-peace movements. So he suggested to Jefferson Davis to bring it up with Lincoln. So even if they refused negotiations, he could come back to his base and say, hey, at least we tried. Jefferson Davis had tried negotiations after Fort Sumter and in the Alexander Stevens thing, and to try again would have been humiliating. Jefferson Davis wanted to recover East Tennessee to undo the previous losses. Joseph E. Johnson told Jefferson Davis the army hadn't recovered yet and gave him lots of complaints, but Jefferson Davis must have felt deja vu because he had heard the same complaints from Johnson before. He asked for a second opinion and asked a guy to go inspect Johnson's troops, a guy named Dalton. And Dalton gave him a way better report that kind of contradicted what, just, what Johnston was saying about his troops. Well, Polk reported a raid from Sherman that might indicate Sherman planned to capture Mobile, Alabama. Davis asked Johnson to go help Polk, and Johnson demurred, saying he couldn't help Polk. Well, Jefferson Davis pointed out sharply that Johnson's front troops were inactive while Sherman threatened Alabama. Sherman went ahead and destroyed all railroad and manufacturing in Meridian and then returned. And Jefferson Davis thought if Johnson hadn't delayed for so long, those losses would have been prevented. Jefferson Davis appointed John Bell Hood, his friend, to be under Johnston. Some people think Hood was a spy to circumvent Johnston. But this kind of uh, inside communication was common without nefarious motives usually. Hood found the army was well-clothed, well-fed, and with good transportation, the opposite of Johnson's complaints. Jefferson Davis knew that they were ready for an attack, and he thought Longstreet, who was near Virginia, the Virginia-Tennessee border, combined with Johnson's troops, could carry out the attack. Longstreet was agreeable and had proposed similar plans before, but Johnson still stubbornly was against advancing. Jefferson Davis appointed Bragg as chief of staff of sorts, and he got crap for it again, Uh, Some thought the appointment of Bragg was sort of like a lightning rod that would reflect blame from himself. Bragg was adequate as chief of staff. Well, they had a few victories in Florida in the Battle of Olusti, recaptured Plymouth, North Carolina, and repulsed uh, the Union Red River campaign to go into Texas. Jefferson Davis's five-year-old, though, died in a fall, and he had to put that aside because the big fights of the war were about to begin. The Army of the Potomac started against the Army of Northern Virginia. It was unequaled in carnage. The Army of the James moved up the James River to the railroad lifeline between Petersburg and Richmond. These two things were a bigger threat to Richmond than McClellan's previous attack on Richmond. Jefferson Davis brought Beauregard to Drury's Bluff to confront Benjamin Butler from the Army of the James. Beauregard, again, suggested one of his unrealistic strategies. Lee would fall back from Spotsylvania and send 10,000 to Beauregard, who would attack Butler, and then he'd join Lee to destroy Grant. However, this plan would have opened defenses to Grant long before the shuffling troops would have made it. Davis instead ordered Beauregard to attack Butler at Drury's Bluff with reinforcements from Major General William H.C. Whiting. Beauregard suggested instead to have Whiting to assail the rear while he attacked the front. Davis vetoed this plan because a Union force would have been able to stop Whiting's approach. 
However, behind the president's back, P.T. Beauregard phrased the strategy to Whiting as his original plan, the plan that got vetoed. And just how Jefferson Davis had warned, Whiting wasn't able to bring his troops. It was, it was a Confederate victory, but less complete if Beauregard hadn't defied Jefferson Davis' orders. Butler entrenched on a neck between the James and Appomattox River, where they were still a threat to Richmond's front. Beauregard held off until the Army of Northern Virginia reinforced it. Grant laid siege to Petersburg and Richmond without knowing it would last nine months. So the author mentions a couple of uh, pieces of trivia. So Jefferson Davis would always insist on returning on a different road than the road he took to a place. And because of that, he was very familiar with uh, the roads, better than anybody, maybe. Um, Jefferson Davis also was known to lead his staff along with himself and put himself in danger going to battles and, you know, witnessing battles. J.D. still hoped Johnson would go on the offensive against Sherman in northern Georgia. Polk brought reinforcements to help Johnston. But Sherman went on the offensive first, doing his famous flanking movements that forced Johnson south. Davis was very disappointed in this retreat. And yet again, Johnson, after having retreated, he retreated yet again another 20 miles, where he assigned Hood to attack. Hood's scouts, though, reported a Union force in his flank, so they held back. It was just a cavalry detachment, but the chance for an attack had passed. Hood and Polk persuaded Johnson to retreat yet again to a more defensible position. Johnston's excuse was that Hood was deceived by bad information, but by this point he was less than 40 miles north of Atlanta. Johnson said he genuinely was trying to find an opportunity to attack, but Jefferson Davis was getting contradictory information from Hood. J.D. sent Henry Brewster to do a report. Now, there's no record of the report that Henry Brewster did, but Mary Chestnut heard from someone who heard from someone who heard from someone who said that in a parlor, Brewster said that basically Hood and Polk wanted to fight, but Johnson was afraid to risk battle. This was disingenuous because how I just said, Polk and uh, Hood told Johnson to hold back, but Jefferson Davis believed it. As Sherman advanced, his rail lines were becoming vulnerable. Cavalry cavalry raids on communication lines had worked to stop him before, so Johnson wanted to try it again, but with Nathan Bedford Forrest's cavalry, not his own cavalry. When Polk brought reinforcements, by the way, he left behind cavalry. Well, Jefferson Davis urged Johnson to use his own plentiful cavalry for it to raid Sherman's rear. Johnson maintained he couldn't. Davis was skeptical, and it seemed like yet another excuse to do nothing. Brown, a governor, remember we mentioned uh, Governor Brown? So he chastised Jefferson Davis for not prioritizing Georgia, and Jefferson Davis assured him he was moving heaven, heaven and earth to defend Georgia. Sherman did another flanking movement, and Johnson again pulled back. Johnson wrote that Sherman's superior numbers had prevented him from attacking him. For Jefferson Davis, this was the last straw. So I do want to contextualize something. I do know that I am, you know, emphasizing, adding sort of cadence, uh, inflection to this narration, you know, trying to really uh, emphasize how much of a chicken and a screw up Joseph E. Johnson was. But I will admit that, you know, it's easy for me to say, it's easy for us to say right now we weren't in battle you know, outnumbered. Like, he, most of the time, he was outnumbered. That was the fact, you know. People like uh, Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee could win outnumbered, but they were the exception. They weren't the rule. So I, I, I'll i just, th- this isn't in the book. This is just my own little uh, side note. A day came when Jefferson Davis received a telegram saying that Sherman had taken a spot that Johnson had withdrawn from that morning. Davis telegraphed Robert E. Lee that Johnson needs to be replaced and asked him what he thought of Hood. Well, Hood had claimed that Johnson had held him back from attacking Sherman. These claims were less than true, as we mentioned. Hood realized that Hardy was his chief rival for the command if Johnson was removed, and Hood wanted Johnson's spot. And he knew that Bragg was receptive, so Bragg ended up telling Jefferson Davis that Hood was the man and Hardy was not. Jefferson Davis hesitated. And Jefferson Davis gave Johnson one last chance. He corresponded with Johnson, asking him what the plan was. Well, from the wording of Johnson's reply, it seemed that he was planning on yielding Atlanta. 
Jefferson Davis replaced Johnson with Hood, and people almost immediately took sides. Johnson was popular with the rank and file because, like McClellan, he was careful with their lives. Hood started attacking, and he kept attacking and suffering twice the losses they gave the Union. The third time, they suffered seven times as many losses. J.D. got more than he bargained for with Hood, who would attack the Union in their entrenchments. Jefferson Davis told Hood he should avoid doing that if impracticable. J.D. urged Hood to raid Sherman's supply line, and Wheeler's horsemen did it, but it did very little. Sherman ended up in a siege which seemed to justify Jefferson Davis's removal of Johnston. Herschel Johnson acknowledged that Hood's appointment caused people alarm. Grant's campaign still had a sense of failure with all the carnage, so a siege compounded this sense of failure. Re-election came back for the Union, and Atlanta was a big deal to see if Lincoln was re-elected or not. Jefferson Davis didn't have faith in negotiations, but some Southerners believed in it, like Alexander Stevens, the vice president. When a Northern envoy was sent to ask Jefferson Davis terms for peace, J.D. said they were fighting a defensive war, a defensive offensive war. When they told him of Lincoln's demands, Jefferson Davis told them they were fighting for independence and there would be no deal. Both Lincoln and J.D. were stubborn about total opposite opinions. The momentum of victory seemed to be on the Confederacy side until the fall of Atlanta. A lot of people thought it was the removal of Johnson that caused the fall of Atlanta. J.D. went on a speech circuit to the South where he riled up morale and appealed to patriotism. He said that like Napoleon's retreat, Sherman would leave with only a bodyguard. When Grant read the report of the speech, he said, well, who's to provide the snow for this retreat? J.D. alluded to sending armies across the Ohio River. Hardy had been offered Hood's position but turned it down, but now he was bitter that he didn't have that position. Jefferson Davis left Hood in charge of the Army of Tennessee and gave Hardy charge of Charleston and Savannah. J.D. brought a guy named Richard Taylor, who was feuding with Kirby Smith for the Trans-Mississippi Army, to command Alabama and Mississippi. To take charge of the whole theater where all these armies would operate, J.D. named P.T. Beauregard after they had reconciled. J.D. and Beauregard consulted, and Jefferson Davis's plan was to go up to Tennessee. But the problem was what to do with Sherman, who was still in Atlanta. J.D. approved Hood's proposal to move north, destroying tracks and bridges. They said this would prompt Sherman to come after Hood. If instead Sherman went south, Hood would fall on his trail and do all the damage he could. Hood started north. Sherman followed. They fought over the same territory they had already fought over. Sherman finally drove Hood off his supply line. Sherman complained to Grant that all his progress would be undone if they destroyed the roads. Sherman pleaded with Grant to let him go down to Savannah, burning as he went. J.D. predicted Lincoln would win on a landslide. And the author speculates he may have wanted that to happen to remove any doubts from Southerners that fighting was the answer, not negotiation. This defiance was what Sherman tried to break on his march to the sea. As Sherman went south, Hood went north and began to move towards Tennessee. Hood went against the agreement with Jefferson Davis, which said he should follow on the heels of Sherman. But Jefferson Davis' speeches mentioned taking armies to the Ohio River, and J.D.'s letter showed approval to do that. It was consistent to an offensive defense, even though it was delusional at this point. Hood's attempts were disastrous. His army lost 12 generals on the Battle of Nashville. The Army of Tennessee was virtually destroyed. He retreated to Mississippi with less than half his troops. He resigned. J.D. claimed he was against this strategy, but correspondence contradicts this denial in Jefferson Davis's part of responsibility. The Georgia militia was sent to mess with Sherman's march to Savannah. J.D. called on Howard Cobb, the commander of the militia, and William Hardy as well. J.D. ordered them to set landmines and destroy all foods and livestock in Sherman's path south didn't really slow Sherman, but Sherman used Confederacy prisoners to remove the landmines, and that got the use of landmines to stop. Sherman thought it was barbarous to use landmines. A source claimed they followed Jefferson Davis's orders too literally, burned all corn and drove off all stock from the farmers 10 miles either way of the railroad, and took most of the horses and mules. He said the farmers were so mad they wouldn't care who won the war. J.D. believed his orders were not carried thoroughly enough, though. If they had... He believed Sherman would have been defeated getting to Savannah. Newspapers in Congress said changing Johnson with Hood was the reason of the failure of Atlanta. 
pressure mounted to appoint Lee as General-in-Chief, basically usurping all power from the Commander-in-Chief. Congress passed a law giving Lee that power. J.D. offered Robert E. Lee that power that night to defuse the sting from the passage of that law, knowing that Lee wouldn't take it. But the law came to J.D.'s desk, and he signed it into law. Lee expressed that he would use it only minimally. Inflation and shortages, malnutrition and desertion were epidemic. A longing for peace spread in the South. Jefferson Davis couldn't ignore the pressing for negotiation. Francis Preston Blair was one of the founders of the Republican Party and was part of the Lincoln administration. He was also a personal friend with Jefferson Davis. Blair set up a visit with J.D. The expressed purpose of the visit was to return some papers that were looted from the Confederacy, but the real purpose was to talk peace negotiations. Blair's plan was a ceasefire followed by a push to drive off French troops off of Mexico. Davis was skeptical but didn't rule it out. They agreed to disagree on the following point. Blair saw it as a reunion of the South, while J.D. saw it as an agreement between two independent nations. Lincoln had no interest in Blair's Mexican adventure, but wanted to keep the idea alive. J.D. knew they would disagree on the one-country, two-country point and sent his commissioners as a kind of witness to Lincoln's stubbornness. The talks were going to break down, but Grant intervened and saved it. Lincoln came personally to Fort Monroe to meet with the three commissioners. Lincoln insisted on three things. One, national authority throughout all the states. Two, no receding on the slavery question. And three, nothing short of ending all forces hostile to the government. Recently, Lincoln had signed the 13th Amendment, though, and the commissioners had no authority to accept any of those conditions. J.D. went to the press and rejected Lincoln eloquently. Alexander Stevens thought his mention of a Southern victory in his speech was delusional. They had a change in cabinet, and the new John C. Beckenrich advised Jefferson Davis to accept the resignation of Lucius Northrop, the commissary general in charge of food. He was replaced, and the meager rations sent to Lee were improved. Sherman was going to go through the Carolinas and up Lee's rear while Grant had him on a vice grip. Charleston fell. Many people urged Jefferson Davis to reinstate Johnston, people admitting that he was a screw-up, but it was still urgent to appoint him. They asked, what will Jefferson Davis do about this problem he has? What Jefferson Davis did was make a long memorandum detailing all the disappointments he got from Johnston, but in the end he didn't send it to Congress. He swallowed the bitter pill and appointed Johnston. Lee told Jefferson Davis that Johnston could from now on report to himself, to Lee. This was his one exercise in authority. They had an epidemic of desertion. But generals criticized Jefferson Davis for retarding the execution of deserters. Like Lincoln, he pardoned the execution of deserters. He hoped clemency and appeal to patriotism would do the trick, but it didn't. It led to one of the main conflicts with Lee. Lee thought Jefferson Davis should not pardon so many deserters. They could scarcely get enough reinforcements. Many people considered the unthinkable due to these low numbers. The enlisting of slaves in the army. They used slaves in many ways as workers. Davis recommended legislation to enlist them to relieve white men. Congress had complied. They ended many exceptions and stopped the paying of replacements, uh, which is when someone could pay someone else to take their place as a soldier. But it failed to be enough. Uh, uh, Somebody named Claiborne suggested promising freedom to slaves who fought in the army, but commanders didn't like that idea. Jefferson Davis wrote a paper where he explained that they should get some money and pay for the use of slaves as laborers, but he added a bombshell sentence that if push came to shove and they had to choose between losing the war and arming slaves, they should just arm the slaves. People really criticized that, but the idea didn't die. Jefferson Davis was towards the end, willing to commit publicly to the idea of enlisting slaves. A lot of people pointed out the contradiction of thinking slaves could make good soldiers. Lee told someone in private that he favored the law, that it wasn't just expedient but necessary. Jefferson Davis signed it into law, although it didn't confer freedom to slaves. He began organizing it, but it was too little, too late. At this point, somebody tried to convince J.D. to give up resisting emancipation. A Confederate envoy to Europe was given the cold shoulder after Sherman's victory. The railroads had broken down, deserters robbed civilians, government officials sent their families away. Lee thought the cause was done, but he didn't want to refuse Jefferson Davis. J.D. meant to continue the war as long as they could, 
He liked to cite Frederick the Great, who was outnumbered but destroyed his enemies in detail. At church one day, Jefferson Davis was told Richmond fell, and he evacuated. J.D. went to Danver, Virginia. He said it would be easier for the army now because it didn't have to defend cities anymore. They could just move from point to point. Then they learned about Lee's surrender at Appomattox. Johnson's army was still in the field near Raleigh, South Carolina. But as time went by, J.D. sounded more and more delusional. Johnson's army surrendered to Sherman. Jefferson Davis was on the run and went two steps ahead of scouts trying to find him. He tried to make his way past the Mississippi River to Kirby's troops, who had not yet surrendered. On May 10th, they caught up to him and his family near, near Irwinville, Georgia. The Civil War was over. He was in prison for two years, awaiting a trial that never came. The author points out that nobody can say for sure that Robert Toombs or anybody else would, uh, would have done a better job than Jefferson Davis. What we do know elicits skepticism. The loss of victory doesn't prove it could have been won with another president. The political needs of dispersion to protect every mile of Confederate territory was a hindrance. After the initial success of the Confederacy, the two tries of offensive defense by Bragg and Lee ended in failure. Two other options were a Fabian strategy of yielding territory to the enemy until the time came to get it back. Like the Roman general Aquentus or George Washington, they could have traded space for time. Such a Fabian defense strategy might have stopped the will of the Union. If you remember, this was Johnson's strategy many times. But Johnson seemed too often to stand by to spare his army. To Jefferson Davis, this was the strategy of surrender. The author continues, the offensive defense didn't work either, but it came closest. Of course, the other strategy was guerrilla warfare, like Bedford Forrest's raids. Jefferson Davis showed little interest in guerrilla warfare, and he was probably right to do so. You see, guerrilla warfare is more suited for a rebel army trying to capture power, not defend it. Plus, it's playing with fire in the South because black slaves could, could have then continued their own guerrilla warfare. The author continues, J.D. was stigmatized that he favored West Point friends like Holmes, Polk, Lucius Winthrop. He also supported people who didn't deliver success like, like Albert Sidney Johnston, Braxton Bragg, Pemberton, and Hood. His vendetta against Beauregard and Joseph E. Johnson got reproach. His insistence on keeping people who were disliked gave him problems throughout his presidency and undermined his power to lead. He shouldn't have supported Northrop, Holmes, Polk, and maybe even Pemberton. His trust in Hood may have been misplaced. Bragg is more complicated. Jefferson Davis did try to replace Bragg with Johnston in the spring of 1863 when it became clear Bragg lost the trust of his senior generals. But Johnston evaded the responsibility, remember? When um, Johnston was like, no, Bragg's wife is sick, and then he was like, no, I'm sick myself. Jefferson Davis also tried, tried twice to persuade Lee to take that post. Beauregard or Johnson would have accepted the Army of Tennessee, and J.D. maybe should have appointed one of them. But, as the author put it, he was more sinned against than sinning. Jefferson Davis was justified in disliking Beauregard, but he showed immense patience with Johnston. Even though the Grant-Lincoln team won the war, according to the author, that doesn't mean the Davis-Lee team lost it. And as the last sentence of the book says, it's not that the Confederacy lost, but that the Union won. There you have it, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned stuff. I hope you uh, have a better understanding of the timeline of the, of the Civil War, especially from the perspective of Jefferson Davis, of the Confederacy. And like any narration, any book, even though, you know, I think we're all glad that the Confederacy lost, you can't help but root for them when you hear the story told from their perspective. Um, so anyways, uh, in the future, I'm going to make a, a review defending Ayn Rand and her book, The Virtue of Selfishness, Defending Selfishness. I really enjoyed that book. So please subscribe so that you're alerted when that finally comes out. Thanks.